Well, we've got a weekend packed and planned, and I know these weekends go fast, but these weekends also matter. We're talking about some of the most pressing issues of our day that I'm guessing if we went around the room, gets very personal for all of us in different ways, doesn't it? Well, you ever heard somebody say something like this? Live your truth. You do you. That may be true for you, but it's not true for me. You know what the word of the year was that came out last week? Who knows? Shout it out. Authentic is the word of the year. It's, I don't know what was just shouted out. I missed that. I have no idea. But the word of the year decided by Merriam-Webster Dictionary is authentic. And when they sent out the release, what they said was, the important thing is you be true to yourself. We don't live in a culture that says discover truth and conform your life to it. Rather, our culture says look within to how you feel and how you see and live that out. Before we can talk about God's design for sexuality, we're going to answer the question, is there such a thing as truth? Is truth important? And what is truth? Really, there's a debate today about is there such a thing as truth and should we follow it? So I figured I'd start with a verse that I know you're familiar with, one of my favorites in John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I'm one of the ways, one of the truths, and one possible life. <laughs> if you want to come to the father or the mother through me, that's cool. Live your truth. You do you. Jesus didn't say that, did he? Jesus seemed to think that truth matters and that what you and I believe about it matters. You know, there's at least a hundred verses in the New Testament in which it is claimed that Jesus is the only way to get to God. Have you ever really stopped and just thought, why does truth matter? about scriptures, about sexuality? Like, why does truth even matter? I was speaking at a conference on a talk similar to this. And when I was done, a student came up to me afterwards. He goes, Dr. McDowell, you just talked about truth for an hour. Why is truth important? I said, well, do you want the true answer or the false answer? <laughs> if you ask why is truth important without realizing it, what do you already value? Truth. See, what's happened in our culture today is there are certain obvious things that we know are true, but they've been pushed underwater. Like you take a beach ball and you push it underwater, what happens? It's going to try to pop back up, but it takes a lot of force to push it down. We live in a culture, in a sense, doing that about truth itself. And yet in reality, it's going to pop up. Now, the Apostle Paul seemed to think that truth matters. He wrote in 2 Thessalonians, he said, with all the deception of wickedness, for those who perish because they do not receive the love of truth so as to be saved. Paul says a couple things. He says, number one, what we believe about truth has eternal consequences. But second, it's because of a lack of a love for truth. Now, I'm not going to have you raise your hands because I know every single one of you would. But the question is, do you really love truth? I know if you love truth, if you're willing to sacrifice for it, if it costs you something. And we're getting to the point in culture where standing up for biblical sexuality actually can begin to cost us something, our reputations, our jobs, and our relationships. The question is, is there such a thing as truth, and are we going to live it out? So why does truth really matter? Well, for one reason, Truth has consequences. Friends, truth has consequences. My uncle's a pastor in Massachusetts, and he told me a story about a distant cousin of mine that I never met because this cousin of mine was deaf, and he'd go walking every single day on the train tracks. Same time, same place. Got up one morning, never occurred to him that they would change the time that the train came. My cousin was out walking there, believing that he was safe, but he had false information. Couldn't hear the warning, train couldn't stop in time. It actually struck and killed my cousin. Friends, truth has consequences. 
if you got a headache in the morning, and I'm not going to lie, I'm 47, so I, recently I've been doing this number a little bit. I'm like, my eyes are going. I knew it was coming. If you get a bottle and you think it says Tylenol, but it says rat poison, you're like, ah, oh, it looks like Tylenol to me. Consequences. Truth has consequences. You ever notice how many decisions you make in a day based on what you think is true? Okay, what day is that conference? What time is that conference? Where is that conference? <laughs> We actually live our lives moment by moment, making decisions based on what we think is true. And when we miss it, there's consequences. That's in part why Hosea, the minor prophet, said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you don't have truth in a relationship, you're going to wreck a relationship. If you don't have truth in your health, you're going to destroy your health. You don't have truth in finances, you're going to destroy your finances. Friends, truth has consequences, but there's another reason why truth matters. I'm going to ask everyone to do this. With your eyes closed, go ahead, close your eyes and point the direction you think is north. Keep your eyes closed. Point the direction you think is north. You got a point. You're going on a journey. You got a point. Now keep your hands pointed. Open up and look around. Now, you can put your hands down. Now, I actually don't know what direction north is. I'm directionally challenged. But unlike a few of you, I can tell you it's not straight up. (laughs) Every single time, there's at least one person who does that. Now, if you're trying to get up to, say, Canada, what might you have to help you know what direction to go? Yeah, GPS or a compass, right? You see, truth is like a compass for life. Think about this. When you know, if you're trying to literally get up to Canada, if you know what direction north is, once you know what is true, then you know what choices you should make. Now, if you've got a GPS or compass that tells you the opposite direction, then there's going to be consequences because truth has consequences. But when we actually know what is true, we're actually set free to make the right choices. So, look, my, my mom is a boomer, and she, a number of years ago, got her own computer and was setting up a new email account, doing it entirely herself. One of the first instructions that came up said, close all the windows. <laughs> my mom, my flesh and blood got up from her chair, walked around the house, and literally closed all the windows in the house. Now, you're chuckling because you know something true about a window or, say, an iPad. When it says close the windows or the screens, it doesn't mean the physical ones in your house. See, a computer has been designed by somebody smart to function a certain way. There's a truth built into it. And when you don't understand the truth, what happens? Frustration, anger, loss, embarrassment. But when you know the truth of a computer from the maker built into it, then you know how the computer should operate. You see, it's truth that brings freedom. We're going to talk about this more tomorrow. But it's always interesting to me that John 8.32 says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Lies bring slavery. Truth brings freedom. Now again, we're going to unpack this more tomorrow. But we're asking the question, why does truth even matter? Number one, truth has consequences. But number two, truth is like a compass for life. When we know what is true about something, then we know how we should orient our lives. That's literally what is at stake with the reality of truth. But there's a third reason why truth matters, and that's because believing is not enough. You say, because believing is not enough. Yes, listen, nothing is true because you believe it. Don't believe me? You know how many times I believed I was six foot ten and in the NBA? I'm only six nine <laughs> on this stage. Not even close. I'm actually about closer to 5'9". I believe there's a million dollars in my wallet. How much is in your wallet? You laughed out loud, sir. I'm kidding. You have to answer that. 
look, even if I did, my great state of California would take most of it from me anyways, <laughs> right? Nothing is true because you believe it. Why am I emphasizing this? Look, you can have your own beliefs, but you cannot have your own truth. You can have your own beliefs, but you cannot have your own truth. I'm going to say it one more time. You can have your own truths. You can have your own beliefs. Definitely correct that one. You can have your own beliefs because belief is person relative. But truth is not relative. Truth is objective in the world itself. Now, let's break this down a little. We can talk about why truth matters. I'm going to assume you agree with me because you're made in the image of God, live in God's world, that truth matters. If anybody says, I don't care about truth, lie to that person and they'll be upset that you didn't tell them the truth. We all know that truth matters. But what is truth? Here's a simple definition that I think will serve you well. Here's what it is. What's called the correspondence theory of truth a statement is true if it matches up with reality. A statement is true or belief is true if it matches up with reality. So truth is when you hold a belief and it corresponds with the way the world really is. So if I told you I drove here from Southern California and it only took me 12 hours because I drove in my new red Lamborghini and you go walking outside and you see this car, my statement just might be what? Just humor me. <laughs> my statement just might be true. Now, if you walk outside and see this, my statement would be what? False. False. Why? Because I said it was red. In reality, it's yellow. Now, if you walk outside and see the kind of car that I actually drive, <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. I had an eighth grader who goes, ah, ha, ha, you drive a Ford. I was like, what do you drive? <laughs> My statement would be really false. Truth is when a belief matches up with the reality. In fact, I've played these games with my kids. I try to think of creative ways to teach my kids something. So I have the word below, and then you have the object. And if it corresponds, you have truth. So that is Wolverine, that is Batman, and that is Spider-Man. Truth is when a belief matches up. Is that smoke in the back? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you freaked out in the back. <laughs> What'd you do when I said that? Most of you turn to look. Now, don't worry, there's not smoke in the back. I can't play this game in California because of all the fires. Like, people literally would freak out. <laughs> can't use this illustration. But you turn to look, and since there's not smoke, my statement is what? It's false. If there were, my statement would have been true. Now, in some ways, you should be with me saying, Sean, this is kind of common sense and it's obvious, and it is. Everybody uses truth in the way we've described it this way. It's inescapable. Now, by the way, the Bible doesn't define truth this way, but it assumes it. What's the Eighth Commandment? No, that's the ninth. I'm messing with you. Since you laughed at me earlier, I got you back. <laughs> the ninth commandment is thou shalt not lie. What's a lie? It's not just saying something that's false. It's intentionally saying something that's false. You can't have a lie without the truth. So the Bible assumes this means of truth. But here's the catch. Everybody uses truth in this fashion. But when the topic shifts to moral values or religion, people will change what they mean by truth. Everybody uses truth as correspondence. But when the topic shifts to moral values or religion, people will change what they mean by truth. So, for example, I'm curious. You can just shout it out. What do you think is the best flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. Chocolate vanilla. vanilla. Really creative flavors up here. Rainbow sherbet? Sherbet is not ice cream, lady. <laughs> Chunky monkey, all right. Chocolate chip, mint chocolate chip, Oreo, cookie dough, whatever I heard. Okay, all right, let me save you some time. The best flavor of ice cream. 
it actually got really quiet when I was about to say this. The best flavor of ice cream is chocolate peanut butter. Now, who says that statement is true? Let me see your hands. Who says that, that statement is false? Okay, wait a minute. How can that statement be true for me and a few of you, but false for many of you? And the answer is because we're talking about something we call subjective. A subjective claim is something that's personal, it's private, and it depends upon the beliefs of the individual. In fact, within the word subjective, what's the key word? Subject, good. The person, the individual, the subject. So in a subjective claim, if you prefer something, if you like something, then in a sense you could say that's true for you because you as the subject are the basis of whether it's true or false, good or bad. When you think of subjective claims, all you think of peanut butter ice cream. Because ice cream flavor preference is a matter of subjective preference. What if I said this though? What if I said chocolate peanut butter ice cream controls diabetes? Usually I get an amen. (laughs) Clearly there's no Baptist here. (laughs) Just kidding. Now, this is a very different, can you tell my sarcasm? I actually think sarcasm is the sixth love language. It's a spiritual gift too. Now, subjective claims are matters of preference. When it comes to the claim that chocolate peanut butter ice cream controls diabetes, this is not a preference claim, is it? This is now a claim some of you gave a little bit of nervous laughter because you realize a lot's at stake with this. This is what we would call an objective claim. See, subjective claims are internal to the subject who makes them. Objective claims are about the object or the mind-independent world. So the key word in subjective is subject. The key word in objective is the object in itself. So if I had a big scoop of ice cream here and I said, this is delicious, is that really about my experience of it or is that about the ice cream? It's kind of my experience of it. If I said, this weighs 24 grams, what's that about? That's the object, the ice cream itself. Okay, so when you think of objective claims, why don't you think of insulin? Because insulin actually helps control diabetes. Okay, now in a moment here, I'm going to ask you to participate here with me. And I'm going to put something up on the screen. I'm going to ask you to shout out one of two things. If it is a subjective claim, shout out ice cream. If it's an objective claim, shout out insulin. insulin. You got it. Now listen very carefully. I'm not asking if these claims are true or false. I'm simply asking what kind of claim are they? If it's a subjective claim, ice cream. If it's an objective claim, insulin. All right, let's give it a chance. Coke tastes better than Pepsi. Ice cream. cream. Okay, good. Even if you don't like Coke or Pepsi and you prefer coffee or tea, you still know this is a preference claim. Good. How about this one? Diet Coke has fewer calories than regular Coke. Okay, so now what are we talking about? The Coke or the soda itself, the object, not a preference about it. Okay, good. Ice cream or insulin, two plus two equals four. Okay, I don't think I've had a single person shout out ice cream, except maybe one guy up here did. If there's anything that's objective, we know it's math, right? Although they're trying to change it again in my great state, We all know that math deals with an objective, mind-independent reality. We know this. Okay, ice cream or insulin. Hawaii is the most beautiful vacation spot on earth. Okay, good. We all know it's Southern California. (laughs) Actually, by the way, the claim, a rose is beautiful, is an insulin claim. If you don't think a rose is beautiful you're just as wrong as if you think two plus two equals five. I am dead 
serious. But I digress. We'll come back to that. I'm serious about that. All right, ice cream or insulin? George Washington was the first president of the United States. Okay, good. Now, what discipline is this a part of? This is a part of history, right? So you can't see this in the same way you could allegedly see smoke in, in the back, but we still know a claim about history deals with an objective mind independent reality. It's not all a matter of opinion. Okay? Ice cream or insulin? Action movers are more enjoyable than romances. Okay, good. Now I know there's one or two guys who are like, I will die on that hill. <laughs> Fellas, I've been married almost 24 years. It's not worth it. <laughs> but that's preference, okay? How about this one? Ice cream or insulin? Sean McDowell can bench press 300 pounds. <laughs> I am not feeling the love. All right, who says ice cream? Let me see your hands. Who says insulin? Who says after the 2020 election, I will never vote again? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Although I feel really important being up here with you Iowa folks around right now. You're kind of a big deal in the news, just for the record. You know this. Now notice, one guy appreciates it. Now, I'm not asking if this is true or false. I'm asking what kind of claim is this? Is this a preference claim that's a matter of opinion? Or is that at least a claim about a mind-independent reality. Do you see the question? Now, do you know how many pounds I can bench press? You do not. You might think you do. You might think you have an educated guess, but you don't know. In fact, to know whether this is ice cream or insulin, do you have to know how many pounds I can bench press? No, you don't. Because there still is a truth about this even though you don't know what that truth is. So don't confuse, confuse not knowing what is true with there being or not being a truth about the matter. So if I said there's 50 quadrillion, zillion, zillion atoms in the universe, that's an objective claim. That's about the universe. Now, will we ever be able to test that? We'll never know this side of heaven how many atoms exist, but there is a mind-independent truth about how many atoms exist, even if we don't know what that specific number is. So this is insulin. Now, some of you are like, yeah, but can you do it? Here's the deal. I cared before I turned 40. Now I just want to stay alive. All right, ice cream or insulin? Earth is the center of the solar system. Okay, insulin, good, but you hesitated. Why? Because this statement is what? It's false. Can you have a false insulin claim? Sure, if I said 2 plus 2 equals 7, that's actually an insulin claim, but it's false. If I said George Washington was the 17th president of the United States, that's an insulin claim, but it's false. So far, you've told me, just for the record, you've told me mathematical claims are like insulin. You've told me historical claims are like insulin. You told me this scientific claim is like insulin. I want everybody to vote on this next one. Ice cream or insulin, abortion is wrong. Ooh, it got quiet and mixed in that response. Who says ice cream? Show of hands. Who says insulin? Okay, about half of you didn't vote which is typical. All right. Is this a scientific claim? No. It's not a historical claim. This is a moral claim. Are moral claims like ice cream that are all matters of preference, that can be true for me but not true for you, or do moral claims deal with an objective, mind-independent reality? Are moral claims subjective or are they objective? Now, let's imagine for a second that all moral claims are like ice cream. If that were the case, could you ever judge anyone for doing anything morally wrong? No. You couldn't judge genocide. You couldn't judge rape. You couldn't judge 
theft, you couldn't judge murder, you couldn't judge terrorism, nothing. You could no more say something is morally wrong than when you laughed when I said, I'm going to tell you what the best flavor of ice cream is. Because it'd be a matter of preference if morality is like ice cream. But here's an example where our culture says, live your truth. That may be true for you, but not true for me. But no one actually believes that. No one really is a relativist. One way to find this out is to let the beach ball pop to the surface and point out inconsistencies in the way people think. So I had a fellow a number of years ago having a conversation about abortion. He said, if you don't like abortion, don't have one. Now notice his thinking. He said, if you don't like abortion, don't have one. If you don't like chicken, get the fish. If you don't like coffee, get tea. If you don't like abortion, don't have one. (laughs) You see what he did? He shifted the question of the morality of abortion into the realm of preferences, like ice cream flavor. I said, I'm curious, are you against slavery? He said, of course. I said, then if you don't like slavery, don't own a slave. Are we against slavery because we don't like it? Yeah, I don't prefer it. Or are we against slavery because it's wrong to own and mistreat another human being based on something secondary like skin color? Friends, everybody knows there's right and they know there's wrong. How do I know that? Well, for one, Romans 2 tells us even people without the law know the moral law because it's written where? On their hearts, on their consciences. You want to know what someone believes about morality? It's not by what they say, but what? And it's actually not by what they do. I set you up again. It's not by what they say. It's not by what they do. But it's by how they want to be treated. (laughs) Think about it. People break a promise to you. But the moment you break a promise to them, they'll cry foul. C.S. Lewis brilliantly wrote in Mere Christianity. He said, the moment somebody tells you there's no such thing as right and wrong and you break a promise or lie to them, they will tell you you've done something objectively wrong. I was just having this conversation with, I teach at Biola University full-time, but I still teach a high school class three mornings a week, which is fun. I have my 16-year-old daughter in class, which is pretty cool. And I was saying to my students, I'm saying, look, if somebody tells you there's no such thing as right and wrong, cut in front of them in line. What are they going to say? Hey, that's not right. That's not fair. As if there's some standard of fairness we're all bound to follow. You see, you know what someone believes about morality, not by their actions, but by their reactions. You know what someone believes about right and wrong, not by their actions, but by their reactions. A number of years ago when I was teaching high school full-time before I I started at Biola, some of my students came running into my classroom after school and they go, Dr. McDowell, Dr. McDowell. At the public school across town, this this free-thinking atheist group bought in a speaker and 100 students came in to hear about atheism. They're like, what do you want to do? We came up with this idea that we would challenge three of my students at a private Christian school to challenge three of these atheist agnostic students to a public debate at our church on intelligent design and evolution, historical Jesus, and morality, and they accepted. And like this, it was full. It was full, but people were like standing along the sides watching these high school students debate the big questions of life. Well, one of my students got up there. I had trained her, and she said, we all know there's right and wrong. We expect people to follow it. That's because we know there's a moral law. And if there's a moral law, the best explanation is there's a moral law giver. Right and wrong points to God. And she sat down. One of their students said, there's no moral law. There's no right and wrong. It's all preference. You live according to your convictions. We live according to ours. Sits down. Notice the contrasting difference. Time for the closing speech. Usually in the closing speech, you sum up why you think you won, the points you made, and why the other side lost. This student walks up there who had just said moments earlier 
There's no objective, right and wrong. It's all a matter of preference. Walks up behind the podium and notices in an audience about this size, maybe 400 people, primarily Christians. He looks out there, he goes, you know what? You Christians are a bunch of bigots. You're hateful, you're homophobic, and you're intolerant. Shame on you. Repeats himself and sits down. Do you notice the contradiction? There's no objective right and wrong, but you bigoted, hateful, immoral Christians have violated every objective moral code and should have behaved differently. I don't know how he speaks both of those without his head exploding. I actually know how he does so because his heart tells him that there's right and wrong, but his worldview and his mind suppresses what he knows is true. Now, I couldn't do this, but I was watching the debate. If I was there, I would have walked up and I would have said, thank you for that wonderful speech. You just conceded the debate. You said there's no right and wrong, and then you proceeded to morally condemn every single person in this audience, which tells me you really believe there's a right and wrong, which means there must be a God. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> Friends, we know there's right and we know there's wrong. It's objective, and we know it by our reactions. By the way, what is the question of abortion? What's the root of the question? In almost every moral question, there's a central question. By the way, when we get to talking about sexuality and homosexuality, the root of the question is, is there a designer who has made the world a certain way and made his design known to us? Is there a God who's made us and revealed his will? That's the root of the question. What's the root of the question for abortion? So I would imagine some of you go home tonight and you notice there's some dirty dishes, so you decide to do the dishes. Now, for some of you, this is going to take a lot of imagination. <laughs> You're doing the dishes. A younger brother or sister or maybe grandkid comes up behind you. You can't see and says, hey, bro, hey, sis, Papa, Grammy, can I kill this? Now, before you say yes or no, what question would you ask? What is it? If you turn around, it's a cockroach, you'd be like, hurry up. If you turn around, it's a little puppy, you'd be like, whoa, what's wrong with you? You don't treat animals that way. If you turn around and go, hey, I pulled this infant out of a carriage down the street, you'd be like, whoa, definitely not. Now, why should you treat a human being different than you treat a roach? The answer is what it is. How we treat something depends upon what it is. That's why the Nazis had to dehumanize the Jews and call them vermin because you exterminate vermin and you treat human beings differently. The heart of the question for abortion is what is the unborn? Friends, if it's not a human being, no justification is necessary. If it is a human being, then what justification is adequate to take the life of an unborn, precious human being? That's the root of the question. Now, by the way, before we get back to our talk, I just have to pause for a second and say, I imagine a group this size, some of you have some experience with abortion. Please do not hear me judging or condemning you. It is not the unforgivable sin. There is grace and love and freedom and acceptance for you, but that only comes when we first recognize truth. Amen? All right, moral questions I think we know are like insulin. By the way, if morality is like ice cream, what would that do to the gospel? There'd be no reason for Jesus to die. Ice cream or insulin, three quick ones. Jesus was a carpenter. Insulin. Jesus died on the cross in 80, 30. Insulin. Now, someone argued 29, some 33. There's debate about this, but it's still an insulin claim. How about this one? Jesus resurrected as proof that he is divine. Okay, good. Now, this is a historical claim with theological implications. That Jesus resurrected as proof that he is God? Now let's get some clarity on this to make sure we're all on the same page. Nobody dies and goes to hell 
just because they don't believe in Jesus. You realize that, right? Nobody dies and goes to hell just because they don't believe in Jesus. People die and spend eternity separated from their creator because of a rebellion against their creator, because of a moral virus the Bible calls sin. And to say that Buddha or Krishna or Muhammad or any other religious figure can forgive my sins is like saying chocolate peanut butter ice cream controls diabetes. It doesn't work in the objective real world. Why is Jesus the only way? Have you really thought about that? Because frankly, two of the biggest virtues in our culture today are inclusiveness and diversity, right? Christianity has the diversity thing down. It's built into God's character, built into the family. God, every nation and race and ethnicity will worship God. That's built into the church. But inclusiveness, Jesus seemed to say the gate was narrow. That seems pretty exclusive, doesn't it? So why, why is Jesus the only way? Here's the simple yet deep truth. Jesus is the only way to God because Jesus is the only one who fixed the brokenness that separates us from God. Jesus is the only one who identified the problem and actually fixed it. Look, if your car runs out of gas, it doesn't do any good to rotate the tires, exchange the spark plugs, grab an electrical current and try to charge your car, you got to identify the problem and fix it. The root of the problem in the world is not economic. The root of the problem in the world is not like New Age says, we forgot that we are God. The root of the problem in the world is sin. There is an objective moral code built into God's very own character. And when we sin, it separates us from God. Jesus paid the debt that we couldn't pay and offers us salvation if we're simply humble enough to accept it. Jesus is the only way to God because he's the only one that fixed the problem that separates us from God. But what makes Christianity unique is it's not the kind of system that can be true for you but not true for you. It's actually built upon a single, testable, historical event namely the resurrection. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Do you realize how Christianity is tied to a single, testable, historical event from 2,000 years ago? In fact, if Jesus really died in 2030, we are almost up to the 2,000-year anniversary, aren't we? It's an interesting thing to think about. So if you're there with Thomas, he said, I will not believe unless I can see and touch the spear wounds in Jesus. You could have reached out and touched the spear wounds in his side. You said, if you were there with the women at the empty tomb, you could have seen a ton and a half stone rolled away, ducked down, entered into and seen the linen cloth of Jesus laying there and the body gone. If you're at the cross, you could reach down and touch the cross and got a splinter on your hand and felt the trickle of warm blood coming down. Friends, either we believe in Jesus or we don't believe in Jesus. But the claims of Christianity are not the kind of claims that can be true for you, but not true for me. They're true or they're false. We believe them or we don't. That's how much is at stake. Now, you maybe you've heard someone say something like this. Well, there is no truth. There's no truth. Now, hopefully you notice something kind of odd about this statement. If somebody says to you there is no truth, ask them a very simple question. Is that true? If they say no, then say, then why should I believe it if you don't think it's true? If they say yes, then say, I just want to make sure I understand that it's true that there's no truth. 
Now, I don't know that I've ever had somebody look at me and say, there's no truth, but I've had people say things to me like, wow, Sean, you shouldn't judge. My question is, is that your judgment? Because <laughs> if we shouldn't judge, I'm curious why you get a pass and I don't. I've never had somebody say, well, there's no truth, but I have somebody say, well, you shouldn't force your morals on somebody else. My question is, is that your morality? Yes. That if we shouldn't force our morals on other people, and that's your morality, then why are you forcing that morality upon me? You should be more open-minded to views different than your own. Okay, is my view different than yours? Yes. Then if we should be open to views different than our own, then why aren't you open to my view, which is different than yours? Friends, we know there's such a thing as truth. The question is not, is there truth? The question is, what is true? How about this one? Well, sincerity is more important than truth. As long as you sincerely believe something, that's your truth. The problem is, People can be sincerely wrong. And you know what? You can be insincerely right. Sincerity has nothing to do with whether something is right or wrong, true or false. How about this one? Isn't it arrogant to think that you are right? I'd like to think I'm a pretty nice guy. I have conversations with a lot of people who see the world differently than I do, and I try to extend charity and kindness to people who see the world differently. But I've had people tell me, gosh, that's so arrogant you think you're right. Notice what just happened. This is called an ad hominem, where we're no longer talking about the subject, but we're talking about the the issue, but we're talking about what? The subject. Now, if somebody says you're being arrogant as a Christian, the spirit-filled response is to say, you know what, if I've been acting arrogantly, I apologize. Humility is a Christian virtue. I will try to do better. But maybe you could help me understand why my alleged arrogance has anything to do with whether my argument is right or wrong, true or false. You can be arrogant and be right. You can be arrogant and wrong. You can be humble and right. You can be humble and wrong. Don't confuse somebody's attitude with whether something is true or false. Now, is there a connection between humility and knowing truth? Absolutely. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In our conversation this weekend on sexuality, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the key issue is do we fear the Lord and do we have biblical authority? To be honest with you, something that's been in my mind the last few weeks is I am actually stunned at how many Christian leaders... (laughs) And professors, just take God's word like a wax nose and make it fit what they want it to say. Have we no fear of the Lord? The root of the question is, has God spoken? If he has, we better have some fear and trembling in how we understand God's word. I think the root of the issue in the church today with sexuality is not will you use preferred pronouns, although we'll get to that. It's not will you go to a same-sex wedding, we can talk about that. It's not how you help a young Christian or a young family who has a child who's rebelling and identifying as LGBTQ. The root of the question is biblical authority. Do we fear God and follow his truth? That's the root of the question. How about this one, though? But it feels true to me. My dad said this to me a while ago. He said, son, I think we've hit a point in culture where feelings are now trumping science. And I think he's right. Feelings are beautiful. Feelings make us come alive. Feelings are a gift from the Lord. And sometimes if you don't feel good about something, that might be a good indication you shouldn't do it. But if you base your life, young people, on how you feel, you will wreck and destroy your life. A lot of maturity is learning when to follow and not follow your feelings based upon a higher standard of truth, namely God's word. Jesus didn't say, I'm one of the ways, one of the truths, and one possible life. What did he say? He said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one gets the Father but by me. 
Let me show you one more and then we're gonna take some questions. How about this one? But all religions are true. All religions are true. Increasingly, even self-identifying Christians will say that Jesus is my way, but you may have a different way. I put a simple chart up. I'll leave this up here, but I, I threw this together with Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity and their view on God, salvation, and other religions. In Buddhism, most forms, there is no God. Certainly not a monotheistic God. Hindus, many gods, or some would say one God, many forms. Jews, one God, Yahweh. Christians, one God, Allah. And I'm sorry, Muslims, one God. That is the second one I made tonight. Do not quote me on that. Muslims, one God, Allah. Christians, one God in three persons. I'm actually going to visit a mosque this Thursday, making a video trying to show dialogue with, with a Muslim and a couple of imams. I'm going to take my son and visit a mosque. One thing many Muslims will tell you, I was riding a cab with a Muslim recently, and he said, oh, that's great you're a Christian because we worship the same God. I always play dumb and go, oh, you believe Jesus is God. <laughs> and of course they don't. That's actually the worst sin you can commit on Islam. It's called shirk. You've basically destined your soul to hell. Friends, salvation cannot be enlightenment, reincarnation, the law or covenant, five pillars, and grace. It can't be something you earn and also a free gift. All religions could be false, but they can't possibly all be true. In the larger question of sexuality, we've got to have confidence that when we're talking about marriage, we're talking about life, we're talking about God's design for sexuality, that these are not just preferences. These are actually about the way the world really is. The battle, in a sense, is about biblical authority and is there such a thing as truth, an objective truth that we are to conform our lives to? Satan is the father of lies. Jesus is the truth. Amen. Thank you. There is at least one Baptist here. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Truth matters. The beginning, I asked you a question. Do you love truth? I think we're at a point in our culture where Believing Christian truth, in particular on the issues of sexuality, can begin to cost us something. A job, a relationship, a reputation. The question is, are we going to boldly and lovingly and graciously and firmly speak and live out this truth? That's the challenge. Now we're gonna shift to a Q&A time in some ways, I, I hope you see the connection. The whole purpose of this talk was to frame things, to help us think about how do we enter into this conversation about sexuality. If we don't talk about this, so many people hear, well, we're talking about what works in my life. We're talking about what I prefer. I'm saying, no, this is about what is true and about what is real. There is such a thing as truth. We have to be willing to know it and follow it because truth is what brings real freedom.